all about law, society, scholarship, and fandom. Welcome to Semantic Shenanigans. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Semantic Shenanigans, episode number lucky 13. As always, I am Janet Gerson Siegel, and here with me from an undisclosed location somewhere in the Midwest for this holiday extravaganza on ice is my partner in crime, Shanna Gilkinson. And this time it's personal. <laughs> oh, wait. That, well, I mean, well, they could if they put Sharknado on ice, which I think would be a good idea. Could they play hockey, too? Hockey is already on ice. Well, yeah, but I mean, Shark's playing hockey. This is, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be great. <laughs> you know, just, just, you know, just take every genre and just throw it in the blender. So, you know, you have the, you know, sort of the, the inspirational uh, sports movie where the, you know, the under, underdog team suddenly comes together and gels sort of like, you know, um, Major League or, 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 um, uh, Durham and uh, uh, along with uh, sharks eating people. Yeah, I I would watch the hell out of that. Actually, <laughs> the universe is crying for this. <laughs> it's the best thing we didn't know that we needed. <laughs> exactly. See, this is this, these are the heroes that you, you didn't know you need or deserved. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to suffer alone. <laughs> <laughs> and, and never in silence. So, uh, so, <laughs> so, what's shaking, girlfriend? What's been going on? Okay, so I am still like kind of on this uh, sleep deficit thing. I I talked last time about how I had to take my prelim exams for my doctoral program. So I did those over Thanksgiving week. I turned them in on Monday. So for those of you who are not familiar with graduate school, uh, but maybe you went to college or even this might have happened in high school, you know how sometimes you have to take like an essay test? Of course. Uh, yeah. So, you know, you have to write answers and stuff. So... <coughs> The, the, the way I describe this to people is that it was the essay test from hell. I had eight days to write four papers that ranged in 18, uh, 30 something pages each. Ick. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of betting that the fourth one that I wrote wasn't all that great. <laughs> 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 but, uh, it, it was, um, it was an experience. I, and one of my questions, because I'm writing about um, sexism in fandom, and and I'm looking at the Star Wars fandom, one of my questions was great because basically what it boiled down to was in in 18 to 25 pages, tell me everything you know about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that could go on for a while, yeah. Exactly. Well, and I went two pages over, right? But, you know, whatever. It is what it is. Um, so, yeah, that was just really, really intense. It meant missing th Thanksgiving with my family, so I didn't get to see my mom. I didn't get to see my aunts, um, any of that. Aww. So that was kind of a bummer. Um, so in order to treat myself, um, my friend who is also the chair of my dissertation committee, she uh, is a professor that, you know, like at, at our level, like sometimes they become these professors that you become friends with. And uh, she and I went to go see Gary Newman in Detroit last night. So for those of you who you know, maybe the name sounds kind of familiar, but you can't place him uh, in 1979, 1980, he had a hit single cars and we'll put the link up to that <coughs> for you. Um, so Americans regard him as a one hit wonder, even though he's had a 40 year career and has charted very well in England and Europe lots of times. Oh, wow. It was so a lot of fun. It was a great show. We were nice and close, and we'll talk a little bit more later on in the show. Awesome. I, I as I recall, in um, uh, the uh, the fall of '79 was when I started college, and uh, that first Halloween, I do remember a guy dressing as Gary Newman for his costume for uh, Halloween. Got the noise. I probably see. I was. And when that song came out, so I probably would have followed that guy around like a little pest. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, 
days of our misspent years. <laughs> so, uh, so, so what, I, did, yeah. what did you do, like, all last month since uh, we all <laughs> sat down for one of these fireside chats? Yes, uh, yes, indeed. So, yeah, some, something's on fire, I'm sure. So, um... <laughs> So I uh, so I had uh, Thanksgiving with my folks, and uh, so that was that was lovely and uh, very tasty and wonderful, and um, we had a lovely time in in New York. And um, the other thing about November is it's Nanorimo month. So I was writing, writing, writing uh, in a wholly original novel for uh, for the month, and and actually it's not finished yet. Uh, but the the concept behind Nano is that you write at least fifty thousand um, words towards uh, towards a novel of some sort. It doesn't, it, you know, you could be in the middle of it as long as you write an extra fifty thousand during the month of November. And I hit fifty thousand on the twenty first. Congratulations! Thank you very much. So I'm currently at like seventy two thousand, and I I suspect this one is going to also hit a hundred k because the last two years that I've done this, the novels have hit a hundred thousand words. I feel like I've done that with those prelim essays. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. And so what I've been doing is on, like, like on Facebook, I'll uh, I'll give people the stats. You know, I'll tell them how many words I've written in a day, how much how much I've got is a total, and I'll also give them a snippet of something that I've written. Uh, and uh, on Twitter, uh, the Nano. Uh, um, that account actually asked, you know, what are some of your favorite lines? And uh, I used the one with uh, with the Yiddish word "fishtinkene," uh, <laughs> which sort of sort of means exactly what it sounds like. I it's, was going to uh, ask. <laughs> yeah. So 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 basically, it is um, actually I, I can find it. I will find you the little scenelet if you'll vamp for a moment. Yeah, sure, not a problem. So fish stinking us. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm hearing fish and <laughs> I'm hearing stink and I'm hearing Anna, so I'm thinking a fish is stinking in something. Um I don't know. Listeners, uh well there's probably people out there who know what it means, but uh yeah, so this is a good moment to speculate <laughs> until Janet finds it. Did you find it yet? Yes, yes I did because it's the only time I use the word, so you know, the, the <laughs> control F is is a wonderful thing. So to give you just a tiny bit of background, the the story a big part of this story is that there's an enormous global power outage been going on for quite a while so um so my characters they, they're actually on my street <laughs> uh you know i went with a uh i went with a scene that i know very well and uh but you know obviously these are these are not real people and uh one of them is a, a uh two two of the kids actually are um two of these people are middle schoolers who are like 14 years old they're eighth graders and one of them is a kid named douglas but he calls himself des and uh another one is noah who is a who is a grown-up he's actually a reporter and it's his house so here's the little scene <clears throat> des brought the logs to the fireplace the fire was dying down mind if i open the fireplace doors and put a log on is good said the younger woman who's that asked the old woman in a voice as rough as des's hands were becoming in the cold stephen no ma noah said coming in from the back dad's been dead for years this is des what kind of a for stinking a name is des she just insult me. So there's the scene. Fishtinkina means screwed up, messed up, stinky, rotten, bad, weird. You know, it, it's all of those negatives. Gotcha. See? This is an educational show. I know. <coughs> we we learn stuff every month. It's pretty amazing, which kind of fits with the academic part of the thing. Absolutely. And uh, so the other thing that's been happening this month is that there's still work being done on my downstairs bathroom. No. Still, it's not done. Because I've bought, I kid you not, a total of four separate sinks. What? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, all right. So the first one was, and, and I'm, I'm really kind of PO'd at uh, Home Depot because the guy who was, and then he was really, really helping us. Uh, he should have noticed that the bottom that we had bought didn't, um, couldn't fit with the top. So that was the first one. So that didn't work. So, okay. So I go back and I get the thing to work with the bottom that we've got. 
the guy comes over to install it and he says, you know, this thing is enormous and it's taking up like three quarters of your room. And, and he was right. It was just huge. It was like, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about a very tiny little half bath here. This thing is, you know, like, like huge. He says, go back, you know, get, get the smaller version of everything. So I take it back. I get the smaller version of the pedestal. I get the smaller version of the bowl. Fine. Awesome. I bring him back. Pedestal. Great. Awesome. Fits. Lovely. Everybody loves it. It's terrific. We open up the box for the top. And of course, it's in two pieces. It's oh. not supposed to be in two pieces. Oh. So, so I go back this time with my husband. And uh, so we exchange it you know, for another one and whatnot. And of course, we open the box. We turn that damn thing around about 50 times trying to, you know, to make sure it was okay. We bring it back, and now with the holidays and whatnot, everything is turning into nobody really has a good day to do this. So they're finally coming back on the 4th, allegedly, and will install my sink, please God. And uh, But then the, the guy who's like the handyman guy, he's got to come back, he's got to paint and, you know, put, do things like put it in the in the. Um, uh, you know, like like the towel bar and stuff like that. So this thing has been going on for about six weeks. But like, you can still pee and wash your hands. Yeah, I mean, once the sinks in. Oh yeah, I mean, and and so well, we were we were all excited when there was a toilet put in there because <laughs> you know there was there, there were like four weeks there where the only one we had was on the second floor, and uh, so but let me tell you, man, do you get in good shape doing that? Just uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you're, you're downstairs, you know, doing stuff, and you're like okay, you know, and then you have to run up and and whatnot. So. Um, yeah. yeah, and so the, so, so the other thing about my house is that, uh, and and now this is where people are gonna like you know get a butterfly net after me and and uh, bring me one of those coats that you know ties in the back. Uh, so I um, <laughs> so I ordered a uh, a black t shirt. Okay, you know, very basic black t shirt from Amazon. I get it. I actually and I checked this. And I received this on the fourteenth. I take it out. I show it to my husband. He's like, yeah, okay, this is great. Looks good. I throw it into the laundry. I can't find it now. It's oh, that, disappeared. It happens to me all the time. I, I, <laughs> I'm missing an entire pair of pants for like two months. I don't know where they are. It's a vortex. I swear it's a damn vortex. And you know, the funny part is, so like, uh, so today I was just looking in the, the bottom of my closet just in case, you know, it had fallen there. I pull out something black, and I'm thinking, awesome, this is great, I found it. No, it's a sweater from at, at least two years ago. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so, as my husband put it, he said, um, it's, you, you, the, the gods have sort of, you know, smiled on, on you for like a moment here. So they gave you something back. It's just they, you know, they messed up, they gave you the wrong thing back. So, 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 so I, we need another sacrifice, apparently, to the uh, <laughs> to the vortex gods. And, and so, also, what I'm hearing is, don't panic if, like, I don't find my pants for another two years. If two years pass, then I panic. I, I think so. You know, it's so I mean, it, you know, the, a big part of the problem here is that this house is huge. And uh, the thing with Victorian houses is there's little rooms and, uh, you know, lots of doors, little rooms and stuff. And there's all sorts of places where things can hide. And that's probably what happened. Uh, is that, like it's probably tucked around some corner or whatever or, you know, behind something. But God only knows where. So, yeah. So that, that, That's hilarious because I have the exact opposite problem. I have a small house and too much crap in it. That's why, I, that, that's why I've <laughs> lost my pants. <laughs> it, 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 we're, we're pantless here in, uh, in December. Maybe which, which, that'll be the name of the show. Yeah, I was, just, I was just thinking that could potentially become the, the name of the show. <laughs> pantless in December. I, I, I don't know. Maybe considering the uh, theme of some of our topics, maybe that's not such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's right. Yeah, it's... Um, the, 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 one may find it slightly insensitive. Yeah, we, we might be a little um, tone deaf and insensitive, so maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll, but, uh... but it's a hell of a segue, so what do you say we go? <laughs> sure, what the hell? <laughs> so, yeah, we um, 
Janet and I talked about this, and and we didn't uh, decide to take on this topic lightly, but with the way all of the sexual harassment allegations have been making the news for like the last, what, month, month and a half, um, you know, Hollywood's going insane, and it's affecting journalism, and... Now, hopefully it would have similar effects on on, uh, politicians, uh, but we have yet to kind of see that emerge. Um, But yeah, we're going to be talking um, just about all the crazy accusations that have been going on. And the accusations themselves aren't crazy. What's crazy is the fact that it it just people are becoming empowered. So it's all coming out now all at the same time so um uh, janet do you want to talk about anthony rap a little bit sure and and actually when i kind of you know pull back on this a lot of this comes from the me too movement or at least it's sort of that kind of dovetails with it where uh you know i'm I'm sure you kind of have to have been living under a rock but i will explain it anyway that the me too hashtag which was showing up on twitter and facebook and elsewhere was basically for uh, mostly women, but, but men as well, uh, who would recount a bit of their stories of having been harassed in some sort of sexual manner uh, in their lives, you know, with the hashtag Me Too. Yeah, I got it too. I got it too. And there was a while there where my Facebook feed was just filled with it. And uh, and I'm on that list too, I might add, because uh, my, second, uh, my second law job, there was a male paralegal. And uh, he... Uh, he really enjoyed um, standing behind any of us when we were using the photocopier. Um, and, you know, as in way too close. And he would also uh, drop stuff for uh, not so much for me to pick up, but for my secretary. Uh, my secretary, the the gorgeous, wonderful Janine, was also very, you know, very curvy. There's a good way of putting it. And uh, so I'm sure that uh, he figured it was a, it was a nice view for him. And uh, yeah, that uh, that was a good, you know, 30 or so years ago. But yes. Yeah, you know, and, and I, I got to say, uh, me too. And a lot of it happened uh, during my career as a hairdresser. And I, I hate to say it, but, you know, sometimes clients are just gross. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I had one guy in the chair uh, one time that like I, I I pulled the cape off of him when I was done with the haircut and the fly was open and he had no underwear on. So like there was his junk and I'm like, yeah, OK, you got to go now, but not before you pay. And I'm tossing this cape in the wash. Oy. Oh, how lovely. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it just it, and it, it a lot of times, you know, people in the service industry, too. Like, it, it, especially with hairdressing or bartending or, or waiting tables, your the bulk <clears throat> of your income comes from tips. So you feel compelled to, you know, not kick the guy in the throat like you really want to. Um, so you feel kind of compelled to, like, deal with it so you don't completely lose whatever money they're going to throw at you in terms of a tip. But then at the same time, it's like this, this, I, it, it perpetuates this sense of entitlement that people get to be that gross and nasty to you. It, it, exactly. And, and that's the, that's kind of been the theme of all of these is that there are, there were power thing. It's not a sexual, uh, attraction thing so much, although I suppose there might be a few people where that was the case. It's more that it's a question of power. These are, um, the, these are, uh, abuses of power by people who are completely uneven, uh, to the objects of their, um, of their fascination. That's a nice way of putting it. So, uh, um, um, Anthony Rapp, uh, was the end of October, I believe, uh, he called out Kevin Spacey in uh, a BuzzFeed article. And um, uh, essentially what uh, what Mr. Rapp said is that he was 14 years old. He was on Broadway at the time, and so was Spacey, but they were in different productions. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, Rapp went to uh, basically an adult party. And then everybody else left, and, and he was a kid, so he wasn't really interested. So he was sort of hanging around in the bedroom uh, where all the coats were, watching television. And then the last person who was there, of course, is the host, which is Spacey, came into the into the room and pinned him down. Uh, but evidently, not much more than that occurred, or at least that's that's according to uh, Mr. Rapp's own recollections. 
he recounted this story to several of his friends over the years. Uh, but it came out this year. As a result, uh, uh, Mr. Spacey has uh, has had a lot of problems uh, because there have been other people who have come forward and have said, okay, when we were working with him here, he was always targeting younger men, younger men. Spacey himself didn't really give much of an apology. It was sort of like, you know, kind of this pretend, yeah, I'm going to say I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry for what I did. I'm sorry more for the way you reacted. Oh, and by the way, I'm gay. So, yeah, and it was kind of a soft confession to the one that I read. Yeah, well, he, he confessed to drinking. You know, he said, yeah, I was probably drunk. And, I, and he said he couldn't remember the encounter, which, which I, can kind of, I can kind of live with him saying that he couldn't re- recall the encounter because it was a while ago. Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, and if he has had a problem with alcohol, you know, and he says that he was probably drinking, he, he may very well be accurate about that. But at the same time, by using this as a vehicle to come out, uh, that sets um, that sets uh, gay rights back big time. Because one of the things that a lot of folks in the LGBTQ space have had a problem with is that uh, there's this uh, this belief that older um, older folks in the, in the LGBTQ community, in particular, are predators against children. Yeah, and they'll just take this one case and and use hold that up as a C. I told you, even though the vast majority of the LGBTQ community are perfectly normal, sane, healthy, and okay. It, it, exactly, exactly, because yeah, you know, because this is getting a lot of press, and, and of course, there's a, there's a lot of people uh, in this country and around the world who maybe don't realize that they know somebody who's in the LGBTQ base. And so they just see something like this and say, aha, that's it. But what they don't realize is that their neighbor or the person they work with or or, or their cousin or whatnot is is a person within this community. And uh, that they've got plenty of counterexamples. They just don't know that those exist. Um, Now, Mr. Rapp has been, oh my gosh, he's he had on i've gotten actually a lot more uh involved on twitter recently because this has been a very big thing particularly on twitter and yes. yeah and he's he has said that he's gotten a lot of support from people which is fantastic and his castmates in particular have been extremely supportive to him however at the same time he's also gotten a lot of guff from people uh, folks who were saying things like, you wanted it, you deserved it, you wanted to just ruin his career, uh, were unhappy that the, the House of Cards was canceled because of this, you ruined him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, one woman in particular was saying how, uh, what were you doing there at an adult party when you were a child? What did you expect? And also, what are you what are you doing coming about it, you know, talking about it now? Uh, now you're just an opportunist. Which now, is just sick. I, 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 I've been reading these tweets because I follow Mr. Rapp on Twitter <laughs> as well. And I mean, I can only get through so many of them and it breaks my heart. This is disingenuous understanding. I mean, victim blaming is what most of them amount to. And, and I remember reading one that basically chewed him out for ruining House of Cards and, and Kevin Spacey's career. And, and I just, I, I started to wonder what planet I was on. I, I, I just don't know. Well, you know, because it, it, uh, a few things to, to you know, for, 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 the, for the universe to keep in mind, one of which is that House of Cards was pretty much coming to an end anyway. Let's start with that. Number okay. two, Mr. Rapp isn't the only person who said things about Spacey. He's just the one who opened the door. Yeah. Num- number three, um, I, I think people need to understand how children in the arts have to behave. And uh, because because the, and this is actually kind of why a lot of them and you know grow up and they get kind of screwed up is that they're children, but they're also forced to do a lot of things that are very adult. And I don't mean um, I don't mean X-rated stuff. I'm not talking about that. But I mean you can you can be an eight year old child and end up having to become the breadwinner for your family. 
Oh, sure. And and even with, like, these parties and the networking and stuff, I mean, shoot, in the 70s, there were kids that got let into Studio 54 because their agents wanted them seen there or whatever, you know, because of the opportunity. It, exactly, and and that's uh, and that's precisely the case here. Is that um, a fourteen year old child ha- who is in the arts has to network and schmooze just like a forty four year old adult, but a fourteen year old child does not have the the um, the experience and the know how and the street smarts to uh, to be able to deal with that in a way that a person who is a generation older can. Uh, There's also, so this is very, very much a power differential, partly because of the age difference, partly because, you know, obviously, um, you know, Rep was a kid and he he was actually a rather slight kid. So there's a, there's a physical component to it, but it's also the, the whole feeling of, you you go to these parties and whatnot because you think that you're going to advance your career and like you were you were saying about the service industries it's a similar kind of operation where uh maybe it's not necessarily for tips but it's for parts and it's for networking and connecting and saying oh yeah this this director saw me or this person saw me and 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 they'll talk to some director or producer or whatnot and maybe i can get into this or that or, or at least be considered for a part or get up to the front of the, the cattle call and um, because it, because the thing about being in the arts is that uh, you are judged for every every day for the rest of your life yep and uh so it's, I mean, my heart doesn't just go out to how he, you know, to the 14-year-old child from the past, but also to the adult now who is having to relive this and also constantly explain it to people and constantly, in a lot of ways, justify it in a way that we don't do to people who are victims of muggings. Yeah, and, and I think that people kind of forget, like, if, if we took away the sexual assault and substituted in another kind of crime, it, it kind of start to see the ridiculousness of some people's reactions. Um, but because it's this taboo subject, because, you know, America and its puritanical roots, you know, we, we, we have these really weird hang-ups about sex, and if it's somebody who's basically not a heterosexual male it's somehow your fault exactly and yeah and so that that's that, that's part of this dynamic as well is that uh because he's um he's homosexual for a lot of people he's considered to be quote unquote the other and so people have no problem with uh with coming back at him and saying well you should have done this you should have been this way you should have been that way uh you know what did you expect what did you think was going to happen you know don't you think this was going to happen and it doesn't help that uh, uh there's probably a number of people who feel still that uh that this is a normal dynamic between uh, between gay men. That there's always somebody older and always somebody much younger, and that uh, yeah, this this just is you know this is the way it is, and everything would have been you know hunky dory, and 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 maybe they feel that it was hunky dory because after all, this wasn't really um, you know this wasn't really talked about in this kind of a, a public way beforehand. But I got news for those folks. The reason why this didn't this wasn't uh, out there and public is because rap wasn't getting the kind of attention that he gets from being in Star Trek. And that's the thing I think people need to understand is the sequence of operations here is that uh, this happened to him, but he was a Broadway kid, not terribly well known, did more Broadway. He was in Rent, for example, but that's still not very well known by the mainstream. He he goes on to Star Trek. He becomes a big part of Star Trek, and now he's got a much much larger audience. BuzzFeed says, "Hey, let's let's interview this guy." And and by the way, according to Rap, they gave Spacey the opportunity to comment, and he did not. So it's not like this was just thrown on him that he was actually given the the opportunity to comment, and he declined. Uh, you know the uh, the ability to do so and uh, so 
BuzzFeed goes to rap because because rap's got some fame, but it's because of Trek, not not the other way around. He's not getting fame because of this. He got this this interview because of fame earlier. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important thing for people to remember. And, you know, I've been following um, Anthony Rapp ever since Star Trek Discovery premiered. And I, I have to say, I love how he's on his social media accounts. You know, he, he's he's been posting some examples of the hate that he's been receiving over this incident. And... I, I, number one, I love how the rest of the cast of Discovery are supporting him, and you know they're, they're just really there to prop him up. They're proud of him for for talking and and, and sharing his story. Um, number two, um, he had a post a couple of days ago where he talks about how you know he the, the trolls aren't getting to him. He doesn't believe them. He is at no point. Um, you know, swallowing the idea that he is to blame for anything that happened. Um, it, it hurts his feelings, but like he's not mortally wounded over it. So I, I, I think that he's just got such a good, healthy attitude. And, and he's been actively engaging with the fans, even if he's just clicking a like when somebody offers him support. Um, but as far as I know, he's, he's liked every single, single comment that supported him. And I've even seen him replying to some people and, um, you know, just, just such dignity and grace about it. And I even tweeted to him the other day. I said, you know, the way the Star Trek fandom acts sometimes, we don't deserve you. We need you, but we don't deserve you. Um, you know, he- such a wonderful example for for all of the fandom that he's going to in um i i just i can't say enough good about him yeah he's um and and the, the entire cast seems extremely approachable but uh that that he's sort of bared this in a way that uh that he really didn't have to he could have sort of you know uh he could have let all of that stuff kind of you know fall to the bottom and and you know, and and born that cross by himself, but instead he's bringing it to the surface and saying, "This is what people are saying. This is how people are dealing with it, and the way that they're dealing with it isn't healthy." Yeah, and I think too that for people, sometimes for people, this this sort of thing wouldn't occur to them in terms of the negativity that he's receiving. You know, that we kind of have this. Uh, <laughs> impersonal idea that okay well if you're a celebrity this is the kind of thing that you sign on for and you know for most criticisms i might say yeah that's the case but these are just so misguided and mean-spirited sometimes and so i i think that it just kind of helps to show people that you know hey celebrities are human beings too and they're they're they are just as entitled to the same dignity and respect as the rest of us. Exactly. And so, um, so, so let's you want to talk about a few more people because we, we have a list. Oh God, well, do we have a list? <laughs> and, 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 you know, and the, the disturbing part is that this is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, but I think we're going to, we're going to try, it's going to depend on how busy everybody is. Uh, but we're going to try to put a list up on, on our site because I want to get these names all together in one place. Uh, because that is, uh, that, that shows the magnitude of this issue way more than anything else. However, yeah. however, uh, these are of varying degrees. Because yes. fortunately, Mr. Rapp was, uh, he wasn't raped for one thing, uh, thank God. And uh, there was one isolated incident, although other people had, had other experiences. He personally wasn't, uh, that didn't happen to him. But it ain't so, it ain't the case with Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, oh my God. So... <laughs> That that one's yeah. a little harder to talk about because I I just I don't know where do I start with the bad. I know it's like it's like a smorgasbord of bad. <laughs> it's a veritable plethora of bad. Um, yeah, so big, powerful Hollywood mogul uh, finally falls, and we've got we've got people like Gwyneth Paltrow. 
Ashley, Ashley Judge, J Angelina Jolie. Uh, you know, th these aren't th th these aren't C-listers or, or even random people that have come out of the woodwork. These are names of women actors that everybody knows, everybody respects, and they are coming out and speaking about these experiences with him. And, it, and it's truly frightening because the, I feel like the list grows every day with this guy. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, um, People actually has a gallery of, uh, of all the people who have, uh, who have said that, you know, this or that has happened to them. Uh, and man, it's a that's a big list. I uh, it's everything from him saying, "Oh, let's shower together," to exposing himself. And I think it's Rose McGowan had said that she had been raped by him. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. She and she was pretty public about it too. Yeah. Um. This this is a this is a horrible abuse of power. Hey, that there's there's no. I don't think there's any way other way of putting it. It's an abuse of power. Um, this is somebody who had the ability to make or break these actresses' careers, and uh, he basically was was telling them, "You have to do this, or you have to tolerate it at least and keep quiet about it, or you know, as they say, you'll never eat lunch in this town again." Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is, is that um, you know, I, I remember years ago, and there was actually an article about this when the Weinstein thing finally broke. Uh, but Courtney Love, years ago, tried to warn people. Like, she even said something. She didn't point blank say, oh, by the way, you know, Harvey's going to, you know, molest you. But she, it was pretty damn close. She was at a celebrity roast and she interviewed. And she said, you know, hey, if, I can't remember if it was, if a Harvey asks you to dinner or if Harvey asks you to a party or if a Harvey asks you back to his place, but it was something along that line. And she finished it with don't go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but you know. because she was Courtney love, nobody believed her. Nobody, um, gave it any merit. And, you know, because she was kind of a, a wild child, um, they, they figured, well, I mean, there was a slut shamey, uh, element to that. Oh yeah, and and which which there is you know which unfortunately has has trickled down to Mr. Rapp and, and I'm sure to a lot of other uh, a lot of other folks who are talking about other um, other such abuses. I mean, there's uh, we have a tendency to as a as a culture as as a society we have a tendency to uh, create a a laughably high standard of proof. Uh, when it comes to this kind of harassment, this kind of abuse, and which is absolutely not what's actually in the in the law, I might add, but uh, we as a society tend to uh, that that we won't believe somebody if they've got any sort of um, uh, any any sort of ding against them. That the you know oh my God, you're you're not a virgin and you're and you're and you're uh, complaining about this. Well, you know you must like sex. So why are you? Uh, why are you having a problem with this? Or hey, you did this to uh, to further your career. You got your career furthered. Why are you complaining now? Um, uh, you know, or hey, you you were a, a drug addict, so you know you couldn't possibly remember. You know, or you know, how, or you deserved it. You know, you were just asking for it, kind of thing. Uh, the sort of stuff that. Uh, uh, that we don't do uh, with uh, with with other uh, uh, with other crimes. If if he had, you know, like I said, if he had if he had taken out a gun and he had mugged these women, we would have said, "Oh my God, put that guy behind bars," and nobody would have said a word about, "Oh yeah, well, you know, Gwyneth did this because she wanted to further her career," and Angelina I, I, said nothing because she wanted to, uh, you know, to keep, to let the good times continue rolling. I would interject, though, that if we were talking about a mugging against a woman, um, why were you wearing high heels? Oh, yes. There's also you would have been able to run. You know what I'm saying? Or you should have hit them with your purse. So, you know, again, it, it, I, I think that it's like other crimes conceptualized differently. But it's also, um, you know, what I was saying earlier, there, there is a different standard if you are white, straight, and male. Yes. And, 
uh, you, one thing you'll notice in this list is that, uh, apart from the straight part, uh, these are all male. Pretty sure they're all white. But uh, there are folks on on this list, uh, on not on the list that we're going to talk about, but um, but who have been accused. Actually, there is one person who who isn't. So so I'll take that back. But uh, there is a certainly the, um, the majority are uh, are are white men. <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, um, there, there's going to be people out there who are already getting angry because I had the nerve to say white male. Um, but, you know, here, here's the thing. Yes, I get it. Not all white men and not all men. But yes, all women have to worry about it. Yeah, I mean, it's... We are in a culture where, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. If this was a mugging, uh, Natalie, would we be saying, "Why weren't you wearing high heels and why weren't you hitting with him with your purse?" But also, why were you, why were you walking in that area? Yeah, why were you in that neighborhood? Why were you out that time of night? You know, why this? Why that? Whereas, you know, if a guy gets mugged, oh, that's terrible. Did you hit him? Did you call the cop? You know, it, it, it it's, it's a whole different hoop jumpy thing if something happens to you if you were a woman. Now, one thing I want to keep, I, I also want to get across here is that um, everybody who we're talking about who has had this stuff, um, who has had these accusations against them, they're all male. This doesn't mean that a woman can't possibly do this. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, however, one big reason why that why we're not seeing women in that position is because women tend to not have this sort of power. Absolutely. And so, you know, here's the thing. When it happens to men, it doesn't happen to men because they've been historically a socially oppressed class uh, for the last, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, when it happens to women, it is because we are a historically uh, um, oppressed class. It has to do with the social expectation that we be sexually available and attractive. We have to we have to live up to that standard because God help us if, if we don't keep our end of the social contract to be doable. But then we are also in that double bind if anything happens as a result to that attractiveness or, or as a result of that attractiveness or of that femaleness. So, you know, damned if we do, damned if we don't. Of course. Uh, you know, I bet the only, um, the only group that, that comes close is, um, is gay men. Yep, yep. And, 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 and again, that's, it's because of, you know, that, that threat to hegemonic uh, straight masculinity. Um, you know, because now they, they you know, and, and I put this in air quotes that you can't see because I have to do this at least once every show. But, you know, they, <laughs> they quote, fail to uh, live up to this hegemonic idea of what a man is. And the, the, this cultural idea that, that we've had for so long is that, you know, men, you know, a, a manly man, uh, you know, he gets all the chicks, he gets the best one to settle down with, and and that's it. You know, a, a real man isn't going to want another man. Of course, now most of us know better than that now. Um but you know, this is it's 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 hard when when something is is runs so deep that it's systemic. Uh, we we still have a lot of cultural baggage related to it. So like even though like the laws have changed, and and a lot of us are intellectually enlightened enough to know better, it's still really hard to swim against that current. You know the, the the thing that kills me also is I'm I'm looking at because because we um we we reference show notes that and that that's that's how we we stay on track and um, there's over two more pages of stuff on this. Okay. I know, I know, it, it's insane. It, it, it it's insane. So so the next thing we want to talk about and this absolutely directly relates to fandom is the accusation against George Takei. This is yeah. a different animal, though. It is a totally different animal, and I'm, I'm just going to put it out here right now that I struggle with this one because, um, you know, I see a lot of people in fandom who are just immediately dismissive, oh, not George, he seems like such a great guy, blah, blah, blah. And so on the one hand, I 
I, I didn't want to condemn him immediately when it was just an accusation and the news was just coming out. But at the same time, I said, Shanna, you have to kind of remember, um, you know, to, to not uh, be dismissive of this just because you like him and you don't want it to be true. It, it, exactly. I, yeah, and and um, the other thing is, you know, we we respect the rule of law, which means that accusations are not convictions. They're not proven. They're just accusations. Uh, but I think that there's nothing wrong with, and I don't think that there is a disconnect between believing accusations and believing victims, but also insisting on proof. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's a nuance that a lot of people struggle with. Precisely. So now the thing that, that's different about Takei is, uh, so, so here's the background on Takei, uh, is that there is a guy who was a model uh, who uh, was um, invited back to uh, Takei's apartment, who apparently went voluntarily. They had uh, one drink where everybody was happy and fine. A second drink, the guy said that he was um, he was woozy and uh, you know disoriented, and he felt like it like it was something beyond what a second drink would be like. And uh, I don't know, it was so much that he passed out or blacked out. I think it was more like he sort of he sort of zoned out. I, I guess is a better way of putting it. And then sort of came to and realized that he was being fondled. And and this one is further complicated because, you know, uh, a lot of people know that George is a a pretty you know semi regular guest on the Howard Stern show, the, 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 um, and Stern had asked him uh, I don't know what was it a year ago longer something, something um, like that. huh? I I think only about a year ago it was fairly recent. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't too too terribly long ago, but you know Stern had asked him you know if if he had ever uh, I forget exact the, the the exact phrasing, but it basically came down to like have you ever you know coerced somebody to have sex and and you know George kind of you know uh, he he calls it his inappropriate gay grandpa persona, but you know he basically said that you know yeah sometimes men needed a little encouraging and. As soon as I heard that interview after all of this came out, like my heart just sank. Like I mean, I, I could just feel it drop through my stomach and into the floor. It 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 does. It, it certainly looks bad. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, we all we all have to keep in mind is that several years ago, when it was a lot harder for gay men to hook up with each other. Yep. I. Uh, there certainly were encounters between men who were maybe not 100% convinced that they wanted to be in that encounter and then realized, hey, this is, this is something that I want. Uh, I'm not saying that this is, this is you know, justifying rape or that, uh, or that consent is, is not important because, of course, it is. But, uh, you know, it was a very underground sort of culture. Uh, and you know, operating under somewhat uh, somewhat different mores. And, and keep in mind too, and, and context is important. And this is something that we're going to talk about when when we move on for the from the list. But you know, kind of onto a related topic. But the the, the George Takei thing happened in uh, nineteen eighty one, something like that. I believe so. It was it was around there, and then it, it was uh, AIDS. <laughs> yeah, so so it was the very early eighties, and it was a complicated time. I was actually having a conversation about this with my my friend because I, I remember, you know, we were getting very very mixed messages about sex back then. Not that we don't now, but I think it was even worse back then, and. You know, um, we, we kind of, my, my friend and I were referring to it as kind of like the, the Austin Powers <laughs> mentality, <laughs> um, where, you know, we, we knew that, you know, I guess in our heart of hearts that um, it was wrong unless there was, you know, absolute positive consent. But at the same time, though, you still had a culture that was telling you that this kind of behavior 
was okay. And if you don't believe me, look at the romance novels of the time. There was a reason why we call them bodice rippers. Um, you know, yeah. and, and, and a lot of, um, you know, I mean, I, you, you saw some of the stuff kind of on soap operas, um, definitely nighttime dramas, definitely in movies, um, you know, basically, uh, men ignoring lack of consent, uh, the, the, the whole frigid woman who just needs the right man to show her what she wants and melt the ice, um, you know, it, it was a very, um, yeah, I think Austin Powers is a fair comparison. Of course, Austin Powers learned his lesson eventually. <laughs> At least somebody did. Right. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, again, it just, I kind of feel like, you know, we, we con context matters. And again, like, in George Takei's case, at least right now, there's only one person who said something it, it's there's not like i guess what i'm saying is that there's not the same pattern of behavior being established as there is with say a, a weinstein weinstein or a spacey um yeah i think that 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 part's huge uh it, by the way the whole the whole body stripper you know let's uh you know it start it started off as rape and then suddenly everything was groovy uh that's uh that's pretty much the plot of at least 25 percent of the original stories that are on wattpad for example it's also the story of luke and laura on general on hospital. general hospital yep absolutely and so like that whole thing was complicated and you know and i'm watching this mess at 10 years old on tv you know i would watch soap operas with my mom and my grandma after school um gh was the one that i always got home in time to watch all of it and um you know so you're you know th think about you know my generation <laughs> watching this stuff and and, and kind of getting that message about sex yeah. and about consent and about rape you know so i mean god no wonder we're screwed up <laughs> So, so on that happy note, let's move on to the next, um, <laughs> yeah, our, our, our next bachelor. Um, or, <laughs> actually, he's not a, he's married though. Um, Louis C.K. Yeah, um, th this one, I don't know. It, it kind of, um, it, it sort of like has some of the hallmarks of a Cosby kind of thing. Um, in, in that. You know, he, he's got this character and, and you know, he, he seems pretty, I guess, woke is what we um, might kind of sarcastically call it. Um, but, you know, it, it, at the same... I... I on. Um, he... It was just so personal because he had this show that was like kind of, you know, that we understood to be somewhat loosely based on his life and and to find out that he did all of this stuff, it, it's kind of nuts. And we'll talk about that again a little, a little bit in just a minute. But um, yeah, d just the uh, idea that he's putting this persona of himself out there because unlike, uh, you know, someone like um, a, a Weinstein who who is basically just the guy who makes the deals and is behind the scenes and has the power and pulls the strings, um, you know, w w with the uh, Louis C.K., just like with a, um, a, a Bill Cosby, we, we kind of have this idea that it's actually him in our living room and not this character that he's created. And so I kind of feel like that that has an extra sting of betrayal to it for that reason. Yeah, there, there's a, you know, that, that, that sort of, you know, that, that illusion comes crazy. Uh, so, you know, the, the, so the thing about Mr. Louis C.K. is the, um, is that apparently, um, he would take meetings, uh, and take out his junk at the same time. Yeah, ugh. And, and, uh, did, uh, have you seen the ads from, there's a woman who's running for, uh, Attorney General of Michigan. Yes. Oh my God. And it's like, I, I am so mad that I'm not a Michigan citizen anymore. <laughs> her name is Dana. I, I can't recall her last name, unfortunately. And, um, uh, her, her ad is short, sweet, and to the point. And basically what she says is, uh, 
I won't be doing anything like that. Uh, and it's much more important for me to protect you from sexual harassment in your workplaces too. And God knows I'm not going to do it to anybody. And that's a, that's a hell of a, uh, of an on time on point message right there. Yeah. And you know, I mean, for a politician, I, I just want to say that she has just done the best job of confronting the, 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 the matters that are affecting us directly. Um, and, and, you know, considering that uh, Michigan is now also a state where you basically have to have rape insurance, um, you know, because um, they, they, they don't want to, uh, they, they don't want insurance companies or the state paying for abortions if you've been raped. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like that having a woman attorney general who will confront issues of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, sexual assault, uh, the way they should be handled, um, it, it's just going to be so huge for Michigan, right? Yeah, and and, and so, uh, so good luck to her and yeah, so I didn't mean for this oh. to be like a political thing. I can't even vote for her because I live in stupid Ohio now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I can retweet everything that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But but this segues so beautifully into the two politicians we're going to bring up. Yeah, so Al Franken. Um, yeah, so so this one has kind of like a two part to it because like there's the one that was the, the photograph that was supposed to be. Um, you know, just kind of a joke, a gag or whatever. But then uh, supposedly in rehearsals, he was trying to force a rehearsal of a kiss scene and, and, and all this kind of crazy stuff. So I don't know. Let's untangle that one. Yeah. You know, he, he kind of it, it seems schizophrenic in a lot of ways, because uh, because after the first allegation, the one with the one with the, the photograph, he he immediately came out with what was uh, probably the best uh, response anybody can give, which is that uh, he was truly sorry and that he welcomed a Senate investigation. And in fact, he insisted on it. Uh, yeah, it, it seemed seemed very sensitive, very appropriate. But then suddenly it turned into, hey, this isn't the only one. Yeah, so that that just kind of, you know, I sort of had this hope that, um, you know, it was one of those things where like, okay, yeah, there was this photo. It was just a joke. It was a uh, bad judgment, a thing in bad, ch in bad taste. And then we could have this conversation in terms of, okay, it was a, a crappy thing that you did, but if it's something that happened a long time ago um it was just kind of a gag picture that was sort of meant in fun and and you know now through today's lens misfires um you know we have room for allowing for somebody to just kind of like figure it out and and sort of reach this point where they know better and you know do we have to crucify them they don't because there are different degrees of what's happening you know there, there's there's this photo where she's in a flak jacket so i guarantee you even though his hands are right there he's not touching anything um because those flak jackets are pretty thick um but at the, you know so it's it's in bad taste he is touching her on the outside there but it's definitely not the same magnitude as rape yeah i think so, that, i think we have to we have to look at these things yeah so it's a very you know, different we, story we, we had the potential to have that conversation but then other stuff started coming out and was just like okay well there went that idea yeah and so when we when we shuffle over to the other end of the political term we find as my as my father refers to him el presidente <laughs> I'm sure so, there's lots of other ways of referring to him, but we won't do that on the show. Well, yeah, because we're also trying to maintain a certain rating. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> so anyway, so, so without getting into the specifics, I'm sure everybody has seen or heard this. Uh, as we all know, there was a tape of Donald Trump from before he was um, running for president, where he was talking to Billy Bush. Of, I think it was Access Hollywood, right? Yes. 
And, Access to Hollywood. Uh, and he said, basically, I kiss any woman who I see when you're a star, they let you do it. And then, of course, he said something else, which was a lot more vulgar. Uh, and now he's actually claiming that he, it's not his voice on the tape. And um, the folks who work for Access Hollywood are saying, nope, we know it's definitely you. So it, it does sort of feel very symptomatic of a lot of other things in uh, in the Trump presidency, where uh, once something becomes uh, a problem, that it's denied immediately. And that, yeah. that's not, not just for this, but for a lot of things as well. Fake news, right? You know, which I mean, and a lot of people, the, the, the thing that's frustrating is that a lot of people, I think, are buying into this whole, well, it's not even my voice on the tape. And it's just like, okay, well, when these accusations, like, you know, why didn't you think that tell us that then, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's so transparent, but, a attempt at deflection it really is and, and there are people out there willing to defend it and, and when we when we go past this let, let's let, let's let, let's throw that big benefit of the doubt out there okay fine the tapes a, the tapes a lie it's a fake awesome however references to a number of other women are a lot are also problematic although they're not necessarily uh, "Quote unquote sexual harassment." I mean, you know, talking about um, uh, oh god, the uh, Megan Kelly uh, that uh, you know, sort of implying that uh, that she was uh, that she was menstruating, I believe, when uh, when she was having some uh, some interview with him, and uh, you know, and, and talking about Rosie O'Donnell in certain ways, and uh, so even if. Even if you give absolutely every single benefit of the doubt, oh my God, fake news, how horrible. Look at how he's being framed. There's so many other instances. There's, there's lots of other, uh, there's lots of other times where things uh, certainly were said, if not done. And, uh, and those, in addition, are also rather problematic. And if nothing else, it, um, it uh, perpetuates this culture. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and I just want to stress that it is sexual harassment. If, um, you know, w w when you say something that somebody doesn't like and, oh, well, you must be on your period because you're sticking up for yourself. That's sexual harassment because you know why? Because you can't do that to a man. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's already, you know, it, it, it's already a problem right there. Uh, so, it, it, you know, did he do things? We don't know. He certainly talked about them now. And, that, he and he's recorded talking about them. And, and he's proud of the fact that he's talked about it. And he's proud of the smack that he's talking in those recordings. And he's proud, uh, you know, to, to, to have made the menstruation jokes. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's about as misogynistic as it gets without having to touch a woman. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's, you know, there there's problems with uh, with the language too. Language matters, and uh, and what we say matters, and uh, you know, even even on the uh, even on the best days, this is a problem. Words mean things. Yeah, kind of wacky how that how they do that. So um, <laughs> so 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 now moving on to somebody who is probably a bit more um, unexpected. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Garrison Keillor. Yeah, because you know that the, the whole uh, NPR Prairie Home Companion thing. It just uh, you know no, nothing really screams uh, more wholesome than that. Um, but you know, I guess we kind of said that about Cosby back in the day, didn't we? Um, yeah. <laughs> This this was so out of left field, and so it it just again it goes back to that thing that I said about George Takei. Just because they seem like a nice person, just because they seem like they have it together, you don't know. Yeah, it's uh, you know the, we we have a tendency to think certain things about celebrities, uh, and. Uh, what we also do in fandom, just in general, and not, not just you and me, but, but anybody, is we have a tendency to create an identification with them. And that's exactly by design. 
uh, from the art uh, point of view, they want you to identify in some way or another, even if it's just that you're angry at the villain, because that's how you're engaged in the, uh, in the production or the art or whatnot. And uh, that's how uh, disbelief is suspended. Uh, But what also happens is that we have a tendency to let that cross over into a different line where we feel that that's the way the person really is. Yeah, and, and, you know, a lot of times we forget, too, like, uh, with somebody like Garrison Keillor, even though it's radio, um, somebody like um, you know, Louis C.K., someone like Bill Cosby, they're actors. They're yes. good. They make money based on making you believe that they're somebody that they're not. So what, when you need to, what you need to remember is that... If they're a truly horrible person, um, but their their ability to make money depends on you not knowing that or, or not believing that about them, they're still acting. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. And, um, you know, they're, uh, they're hired for these acting jobs because they're convincing. And uh, so it's uh, it shouldn't be any great surprise that they're convincing in this area as well. Uh, but moving on to, uh, uh, yeah, so so Matt Lauer is a kind of an interesting case because uh, he's been known, he's known to have been particularly not so nice to Anne Curry, uh, yeah. who he basically um, got fired. Yeah, and, um, you know, other women have, um, you know, along the line ceased to have been employed at the Today Show, but uh, Ann Curry is definitely the most prominent example, and it, it wouldn't even just come from Matt Lauer. I mean, so here, here's the thing. This is how, like, a workplace can become toxic. Like, I, I remember there was um, a story about a time where Ann Curry had on a yellow suit or a yellow dress, and so in the control room of the Today Show, show they were circulating a picture of her next to big bird with and it said who wore it best oh Jesus uh, Christ. yeah um so it, i mean and that's just one example so you know you, you can't even think of like oh it's just matt lauer like it, it doesn't they, they talk he had a lot of influence and, and so when, when you've got somebody with that kind of influence they sort of set the tone for what passes as okay um, and, you know, in a situation like that, like I teach television production, uh, to my students at Bowling Green State University. And so, you know, in, in, in my classroom, I am teaching the director that they are in charge. But the, the thing of it is though, is that if they were to work on something so prominent as the Today Show, uh, what, what was Lauer making 25 million a year? Was I that believe it? so. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you're working with, um, a star that, is commanding that much money and that much power guess what mr director you are not in charge of that of that control room of that set the producers are in charge until shooting starts and then the director is in charge but you know it's just going to permeate the the whole rest of the production crew uh right down to to go and get the coffee um so it, it just goes beyond one individual. Yeah, it's a very it's a very toxic sort of um, sort of workplace, and uh, because he because he made an enormous number of demands, and apparently he had a little button under his desk where he could lock his office door. Which you know, again, like I mean, you know that <laughs> oh creepy, right? But you know, it, it's just like the articles that I read said that it was to keep people from walking in on them but you know of course me being a woman i'm thinking yes but she can't get out yeah it's uh certainly there's a um it, it, it's almost like a it, it, it's almost like a sports team where the uh where the players are all making these enormous salaries and the coach is sort of making you know, like what compared to them is chump change and unfortunately and they're supposed to be listening to the coach and they're all saying you know you know, you're. We're not going to bother because uh, because we're the we're the high guys in the totem pole, not you. I, I saw a Tell video you. on Twitter today about Matt Lauer, and um, uh, 
Me and uh, what's that Today Show co-host? I I I I'm usually too busy in the morning to like watch these morning uh, news programs. Uh, Guthrie, what's her first name? Oh, I, uh, Samantha. Savannah. Right. Yeah. So she and Matt Lauer were on Meredith Vieira's talk show, and you know they, they were guests, and she brought up a story. Um, on her show, there's a clip floating around about this where uh, she said that it was Christmas time or something. She went sneaking into his office. I think she was like snooping about Secret Santa gifts or something like that. And she opens his closet, and there is a bag of sex toys in the closet. Well, and, yeah. The, the, so, so well, the, the, those are stocking stuffers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure stockings are what he had in mind. Um, <laughs> moving right along, folks. Yeah, moving yes, right st- along. We're still trying to keep that rating here, but we're it's, still uh, trying slipping. to keep that rating. Here. Hey, it was innuendo. I never said anything directly. Um, uh, true, true. Okay, we can move on. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know the thing. If you watch the clip, though, he gets like he he stays good natured, but he gets defensive about it, and he says, "Well, you know, remember we we had this guest who was a sex therapist, and and she gave." everybody a bag and meredith was like i didn't get a bag and like you can't really tell if she's joking or not oh, man. And, and, and savannah guthrie is just sitting there between the two of them just looking uncomfortable as anything it, 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 it's, it was just so awkward to watch and it's just like you know i i it, it was almost like that Courtney Love thing, right? Where I'm feeling like, you know, was Meredith trying to tell us back then? <laughs> we did that canary in the coal, man, coal mine, and we should have noticed when it was coughing. Right, right. So, yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe I can find the link to that and we can put it up. But, yeah, I mean, I, it just uh, it, it's just one of those things where, in, in retrospect, it probably is taking on a whole new meaning on, you know, when people saw it, when it actually. Uh, yeah, it, exactly. And I, I think. I think we're going to see a bunch of things like, that. and not necessarily just uh, just on on the lower side of things. So, to uh, to to veer back towards politics briefly, uh, this broke yesterday. By the way, uh, it's actually very local. Uh, Boston Globe said the husband of the Massachusetts state president, uh, who is a gentleman named Rosenberg, his husband, a guy named Byron Brian, I'm sorry, Hefner. Apparently, uh, has been uh, a little, uh, a little too frisky with people. Let's just say there's a nice way of putting it. Uh, and uh, I will put the links up because I, I realize that this is extremely, um, extremely local. But uh, apparently, there was a news conference today, and I haven't had a chance to um, listen to it or read anything about it. But uh, that that's happening in uh, in this level of politics as well. And obviously, when you are Senate president, you're a pretty big deal within a state, and uh, it's a it's a power thing again. And uh, you know who's got power, and and how much does a spouse uh, have a relationship to the power of the person who actually wields the power uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've been living under such a rock with school and work. I didn't even know about this one until you told me today. I, I, I think a lot of people didn't know about it. it you know, it, it, it's all very Boston Globey, so it's, uh, you know, it's all very local. But, uh, I mean, seeing that, I'm like, oh, my God, it's happening here, too. So uh, so we, we were trying to find a list. Found a list through McCall's. I found a few other lists, but uh, they're not really complete. Uh, first off, Bill Cosby should be on this list, as as we've talked about him a bit. But two other guys who should be on this these lists a little bit earlier. Uh, I, but they absolutely should be on these lists are Woody Allen and Roman Polanski. Amen. Now, Woody Allen is kind of this is kind of an interesting thing because, uh, as I recall at the time, it was uh, it was also embroiled in a very big, very public and very ugly breakup with uh, Mia Farrow because of uh, because of the whole thing with Sunni Previn, and uh, and I recall thinking at the time that a lot of the uh, the accusations about Dylan Farrow 
were uh, that they were a vindictive thing on Mia Farrow's part, and potentially uh, just a part of trying to uh, trying to leverage what it, it could, can't really be called a divorce because they were never married, but uh, to kind of uh, orchestrate public opinion during their very public breakup and potentially uh, try to get full custody of their children. And, or actually some, only some of the, the kids were, were theirs in common. And I think most of them, she was actually the only guardian. And, um, and I, I, I don't a hundred percent disbelieve that now. I still think that that's at least had a little bit of the motivation behind this, but at the same time, uh, looking at uh, looking at articles now, there's uh, there's a lot more to it than what we were told, and uh, that there was a lot more. There was much clearer proof of what was going on, and it's kind of disturbing because this was a four year old, six year old kid, something like that. You know, here's the thing too uh, that I wish people would keep in mind about this. You know, when when we in this narrative of oh, well, she's she's just trying to be vindictive and, and you know hurt his career and and leverage public opinion and stuff. This kind of thing is actually the stuff that usually gets buried as a dirty family secret. Um, you know, w- when I was an undergrad, I minored in psychology, which, you know, really doesn't amount to much. I mean, you know, even if you majored in psychology, you can't make a diagnosis. You know, you just know enough to say that you don't know. Um, but one of my experiences in minoring in that class is taking a class called the uh, the Psychology of Atypical Sex- Sexuality, which you know, it, it sounds um, kind of sanitized, but basically, w- once we were done talking about, um, you know, fetishes and, and things of that nature, we, we also delved into, um, you know, sexual predators and sexual misconduct and things of that nature. And, you know, number one, um, sexual abuse uh, almost always happens. Uh, the the victim almost always knows their attacker number one, and number two when when it happens with children, um, easy access is you know the the number one motivator there. But number two, that's also why a lot of people actually get away with it because it is there's such a stigma against it and it's so embarrassing. Nine. You know, m- most of the time, people don't want other people knowing that this is going on in their family. So when when when, it, when somebody is willing to go public with it, I'm kind of more inclined to believe than to disbelieve. I mean, of course, you're always going to get, uh, you know, somebody out there who's opportunistic and will work any situation, not just one that's sexually, um, you know, ha- has a lot of sexual. Uh, um, loaded meaning inscribed onto it but any situation so we we can't just treat it differently because it's something sexual in nature and because it's something sexual with a child what because they're famous um this is usually something people are too embarrassed to have the public True. And, you know, the one thing also about children and accessibility is that for very young children, if you got savvy at all about the law, is when you're getting somebody who's a preschooler, uh, and, and for the reality is that uh, there isn't necessarily a very clear demarcation in their minds as to what's fantasy and what's reality. And that's just, that, that's just the way very young children are. And uh, it's, uh, and that what that means is that very often very young children are not considered competent to testify. So if you're going to want to get away with something, then, uh, to uh, uh, to exert yourself, there's a nice way of putting it, on somebody who potentially can't even competently accuse you is, I mean, it's it, first off, it's it's horrible because this is somebody who's obviously a hundred percent vulnerable and a hundred percent could not cannot uh, consent. But also that you know, what kind of slime are you? If uh, if you do this, knowing that the chances of you getting away with it are that much greater, because 
uh, because of that issue with young children, that they're very hard to believe, that they're very hard to um, uh, to be uh, to be allowed to. Te- you know, it's very difficult to um, to make it so that they can testify. It, it, it used to be that you would go to court and you would. Um, You'd give them leading questions on the stand. You would ask them things like, you know, what happens if you tell a lie? Oh, you know, God won't love me anymore. I'll, I'll, I'll go to the bad place. Usually that was considered enough uh, that uh, that a child would be considered okay to, uh, to testify if they could say things like that. But they were also often asked, you know, very, very specific questions like, you know, are there elephants living in your room or, you know, whatnot, you know, things that are obvious fantasies, you know, just to sort of gauge what they would say because, uh, because of that. And that's, um, but, but anyway, it's, it, it's despicable for a lot of reasons, but it's all, you know, not just because this is a vulnerable, young, small uh, child with, with no consent and no concept of sexuality at this, at this stage of their lives, but also because it, it's, it's scummy and horrible because uh, you have the potential of getting away with it. Absolutely. Um, you know, everything that you just said, um, children, you know, it, it's, it's so easy. Kind of like, you know, when, when they make an accusation, number one, it doesn't have the uh, linguistic coherence that an adult would have describing what happened. And so it's very easy just kind of redirect that and oh so you had a bad dream about that even and and, and you know children it, it's I mean, adults you can gaslight pretty easily if you're good enough at it and consistent enough with it a child would be no problem whatsoever to gaslight yeah you they you know unfortunately they can be pushovers in that area and you know, and and sort of the opposite is true as well because uh I recall, and I can't remember the name of the, the, the place, but there was a daycare center that was accused of all sorts of things this is years ago, and uh, and then it came out that the that the children who were you know were being coached, and that they were also saying that there were satanic rituals going on and stuff like that, that they were coached to say all sorts of things, and uh, so there's there's that element as well, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily what happened here because I don't think it was, but. Uh, um, I know that people are concerned that that some of these accusations that are coming out, not even necessarily uh, the Woody Allen one, but that some of them are uh, that, that, that there are people who are being op- opportunistic about it. This is the allegation against the um, uh, the male model who was with Takei, and also uh, a lot of people uh, trying to say this about Anthony Rap. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things, too, um, that I find kind of interesting, uh, just kind of shifting to your other example here that needs to go on our list, Roman Polanski, you know, obviously, uh, we can't do anything to him unless somehow he comes back to U.S. soil. But what I find really, really interesting is that uh, the climate in Paris actually turning against him for actually protests. Um, against him not too long ago. So uh, before they were very much into kind of separating the art from the uh, scumbag that was creating it. And uh, now not so much. Uh, the, the millennial generation in France are taking a very different view. And and that's good. I mean, this is you know. It, and then I was reading about this today, and uh, the girl was thirteen years old, so certainly competent enough to know what was going on and uh, and not be happy about what was going on. And uh, and she says that she never consented to anything, and that he raped her. And uh, there's uh, you know, there's no there's no getting around that. There's no. Uh, there's no excusing that and saying, saying, oh my God, it's, you know, it's young love or any kind of nonsense like that. That's not what that is. And, um, uh, yeah, I think that, the, but I think that that had been a problem with Polanski, uh, for several years. And I think to a certain extent, that's a problem with Woody Allen and, and with some of these others is that there's, uh, there's a great affection for the art and that, uh, you know, you don't want to miss out on there being more art created uh, by condemning uh, the person, uh, but they still should be condemned. Um, 
certainly there's uh they shouldn't they shouldn't just get out of it because uh because of winning the oscar for uh annie hall or um or or uh hannah and her sisters or um uh the pianist it uh you know that or, or you know for making people laugh or making people cry on screen it's uh that's that's not good enough Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, you'll recall a couple of shows ago, um, we, we talked about Joss Whedon, maybe somebody else who needs to go on this list. Um, and, you know, I, I, I very, I still believe this, but I very vocally said back then, you know, don't let Whedon ruin Buffy. Buffy still means everything that it meant. Um, we, we have this idea about separating from their art and that you know at some point you do need to let the art stand on its own and this actually comes from an entire um, school of, of, of criticism uh, that we can it actually went back before uh, Roland Barthes he's uh, the the scholar that um, is known for this but um, it's, it's this idea of the death of the author, and if you, particularly if you were in high school or college, um, this was a very uh, popular way to treat how to read critically, and, and what the idea was is that you totally isolated the work from the person who created it. So you basically looked at it in a vacuum. There was no cultural connotations to be considered. You didn't... Con- especially did not consider authorial intent. It just, the work was the work. And now that that's been kind of problematic. Um, and, and I think that it links a lot to some of the problems that we're having in our society today with, uh, um, our fake news problem. And, um, uh, d- just, uh, th- this idea of people not really understanding, um, how context and nuance play a really important role in, in how we read something. I don't necessarily mean like read literature. I mean, read a situation, read a person's behavior, uh, that kind of thing. Because we've been told that when we read something, it can mean whatever we want it to mean because we're looking at it in a vacuum. Um, now, as scholars, we kind of know that that's crap, and we know that we kind of have to consider the author. We can't let authorial intent uh, completely determine the value of the art or what it means, but we, we know that it does inform the art to an extent. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and especially when you get something really personal like Cosby, who did like a lot of moralizing about, you know, just how to be in the world. And, and you know, somebody like Louis C.K., who's, who's, who, whose character we understood to be him, um, it, it's particularly egregious. And I think it's harder to separate the person from the art. But we didn't. You know, just kind of uh, created a character that we all loved and a show that we all love. And, um, you know, it, it's, I, I think it's a little less personal. He did a lot of crappy things to some actresses on that show. Um, but for, like, something like Buffy to be completely ruined, um, you know, because what we do with art, once it actually gets out in the wild, that also matters. I, both aspects. Yeah, you know, they're, 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 um, you know, what did they say on, on Discovery? Context is for kings. It's, uh, you know, yeah. we, we have to see this. The, 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 there's a whole lot of trees hanging around. We should be seeing a forest. Um, yeah. So, so you had some stuff on, um, on Louis C.K., something called Death of the Author. You want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I kind of just did a little bit with Roland Barthes and, you know, separating the work from the author but it, the, the article goes a little bit deeper in that it points out that um, you know w- when we make criticism of work we do criticize differently if the artist was a man uh, versus if it was a woman um, and, and they they bring up um, uh, uh, Lena Dunham and she, she's girls right yeah, I believe so. I just totally blanked. I know her first name's Lena. I am so sorry. Um, but anyway, they, they drew a comparison between her and somebody like Louis C.K. because it just, 
you know, um, with, with Louis C.K., people want to separate the, the work from the artist that more readily than with Lena Dunham and girls, um, you know, th- th- they've been like a lot harsher with her and, and they haven't separated her from her work so much. And uh, the, the, the author of the article that we're posting about this, um, they even reference a um, research study from 2016 which uh, analyzed New York Times book reviews uh, written about male authors versus female authors and words that they used when talking about male authors were more likely to contain words like argument, idea, politics, critic, theory, and women authors were associated with words like husband, sister, daughter, marriage, parent, women. So... It, what it kind of points to is women are number one signed by the men that they're associated with. Yes. And, <laughs> and also, um, you know, men's work is thought to be about ideas and arguments, whereas women's work is considered um, more individual and relational and in academic circles, we would say embodied. And th- this idea just resonated with me so much because, you know, I-, I took these prelim exams and, you know, one of the questions I had to deal with is how um, fans and fandom gets gendered. And, you know, I-, I-, I spent, you know, over 20 pages analyzing how these hierarchies within fandom um, develop and-, and you can trace uh, the, the the fan activities that you know things that people like to do and and their practices the more embodied they become the more devalued they are because they're considered more feminine. Um, so so this one just really really hit home. With well, I mean, this is you know uh, I've seen in more than one place <laughs> very recently uh, the use of sister and girly as um, as being insults. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah. that's, a, that's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> and relatedly, um, I'm going to post another link um, that kind of says something similar about the Matt Lauer situation in that um, it's time to do away with America's dad as our journalistic standard. And so, you know, we, we've got this person who has this persona that comes into our living room and, and it's kind of blowing up in our faces. But it also has the added degree that, that this, um, this systemic misogyny uh, that we have with, you know, people like Lauer and, and Bill O'Reilly and other people in, in, in the news who have had accusations uh, leveled against them, these attitudes are informing stories that they're choosing that are worthwhile to talk about. And they're also informing how they're talking about these stories. So you have to understand that that when you get somebody who's inherently misogynistic like this, um, it's part of the big reason why we're having a hard time progressing to a point where women are equal to men and when people of color are equal to white people and when people with disabilities are equal to those who do not um have to really really question um you know who's making decisions um it's uh sorry this is just because i study media this is um you know just really a big important thing to talk about and sometimes kind of hard to talk about um but you know uh when we look at somebody you know like lauer um you know we we have to think about the fact that you know um The, the whole thing about Hillary Clinton's email um, was a bigger deal than it should have been. Um, there, there would have been, uh, you know, uh, or how should I say, um, subtle, like, um, 
just the way we talk about women, you know, uh, that the article goes into like how, um, you know, maybe like you, you laugh suggestively or, you know, something like that. Like, like if you just really, really do a content and on him, you know, again, we go back and we get a very different, re but these little subtle things shape how we think about the news and how we think about women. In and, uh, you know, we've been influenced by this even don't think we well, we're influenced by all sorts of things, you know, whether it's that the uh, that the questions against Hillary Clinton are harder than the ones against Donald Trump, or whether there's fewer news stories about women, or the news stories about women uh, put them in victim situations as opposed to power. Yeah, even that, but you know, even like I said, you know, it can even just be uh, as subtle as um, the tone of a question. It can be as subtle as a laugh. It can, and, and the way you laugh, um, a lot of things go into making those kinds of influences. They, they're practically invisible. So I think that what the 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 situation also teaches us is that we really need more closely about what we're seeing and hearing on the news. Not necessarily for the reason. So yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. You're a little, you're a little breaking up here. Oh, sorry. I th what you you broke up a little bit too, so I'm not really sure why. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's um. Well, th this is sort of something that we, that we tend to be taught um when you learn uh, trial practice. Uh, which is the ways that you can um, you can adjust the way you speak and the way you walk and the way you um, you hold yourself and your your body language and um, and and the wording that you use. It's a very different story when you ask somebody, uh, "Tell me what happened on the 15th," which is which is a very open-ended question, as opposed to, uh, "You know what happened on the 15th, don't you?" Uh, that there's a that there's a there's a heavy negative undertone, uh, and that's not really an objectionable one, I might add, because uh, you you can't really have a um, an objection that sticks in the law when it's just on tone. Uh, that there has to be more to it than that, and uh, and that's uh, and in an interviewing situation, you don't even have that kind of check on things. There is no check on it, so. Uh, but but when we look at these things from you know when we do a side by side comparison and we say okay this interview had this many minutes and this one had that many minutes here's how many minutes were spent with fluffy things like uh, you know how was your vacation and how's your your spouse and your family and the other one was more things like and what did you do about this policy uh, we're we're being shown two different sets. Of standards um, for candidates and for anybody else who uh, who ends up on these shows or ends up being a subject of a news story. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you wouldn't even necessarily ask uh, you, a, a male politician like who designed his suit, but that's a common question that women get, and and this even happens in fandom. I mean, I was in a Star Trek group. Um, online somewhere, and somebody actually asked, uh, why doesn't Sinequa Martin-Green change her hair on the show? Which, number one, it has changed. But number two, it's like, okay, but you're not asking this question about, you know, Anthony Rapp or, or, or Wilson Cruz or, like, any of the other male cast members. And, you know, so it, it's just kind of... Um, it, it, it just really struck me as kind of a question to ask. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've seen people um, say all sorts of things about Mary Wiseman on that show and um, oh, that they think that she's chunky or they don't like, uh, you know, her face or whatever, you know, poor gal. And um, and they don't say this about other other actors on the show. And it's just like, where do you get off making that saying that this is the important thing uh, about watching this show, that this is the thing that you uh, that you pick up on, that and this is the deal breaker for you? My God. Uh, yeah. You know, just women face so much more criticism and different forms of criticism than men do, and there's still people running around out there who think
All right, we're uh, we're kind of breaking up a bit. Okay, yeah, I didn't hear you either, so I didn't know. <laughs> All right, um, would, uh, why don't we? You want to move on to uh, the next topic? How about that? Yeah, so it's kind of related um, in terms of the whole like rape culture idea, but it's also tied to the holidays and the, this controversy about um, you know the, the the famous Christmas song "Baby It's Cold Outside" uh, kind of hit my social media again. So I thought that I would like to talk about it, especially because um, something came to my attention that kind of puts it all in a different context. And, and Janet referred to this uh, earlier, uh, Captain Lorca from uh, Star Trek Discovery, he has va- very famously said, universal law is for lackeys, but context is for kids. And so this is all about how context can totally shape our understanding of, of how to read a situation. So we, we we know the song "Baby It's Cold Outside," you know, she, um, but between a man and a woman, and you know, she says, "Oh, I I I, I really should." Basically, the gist of it is, is that she should leave, but she doesn't want to, and he flying her with excuses to not go, and and so what hit my Facebook feed um, was actually some screen grabs from a what appears to be. Twitter post, um, or no, I'm sorry, um, started as a Twitter post, but then it meandered over to Tumblr, because uh, I see these reblog marks from there. Um, but the, the the original poster says, I don't think any more people need to record Baby It's Cold Outside. I think we're good there. And the next person agrees, saying it's time to bring an end to the rape anthem masquerading as a Christmas carol. And then the third person in the conversation um basically kind of analyzes it from a cultural perspective uh, from the time when the song was recorded. And so one of the things um, that that really makes people think it sounds rapey is when she says this line in the song, hey, what's in this drink? And, you know, through today's lens, because we've heard of, you know, so many people getting roofied at clubs and parties and like that and you know we know what we know today about date rape it's really easy to hear that line and and think oh my god she got roofied he's going to totally take advantage of her that and the other but if we think about it contextually uh this person says back in the 30s and 40s hey what's in this drink was just a stock joke at the time punchline was invariably that there wasn't anything in the drink or that it was like a really weak drink. So basically it it was kind of an indicator that people were using the possibility of alcohol to get away with doing something that wasn't necessarily socially acceptable, but get to do it anyway. So in the context of the song, she's staying late. She doesn't have a chaperone at a man's house. And and in the 40s, we have to remember that, you know, this was a very big no-no for women at the time. Um, and, and the woman in the song says this outright many, many times. This, this person points out, um, you know, she's worried about what other people will think about her staying at the guy's house. Um, you know, her maiden aunt's mind is vicious, is one of the lines. Um, there's there's bound to be talk tomorrow. She's worried about her reputation. Um, but she's having fun, and she doesn't want to go, and she wants to stay with this guy that she likes. Um, so she's... You know, kind of like looking for an out in order to be able to stay by blaming it on the drink. Um, so, so that's where the whole "Hey, what's in this drink?" joke kind of comes in. Um, you know, and then as this person points out, the joke is about how she's perfectly, actually perfectly sober and about to have awesome consensual sex and use the drink for plausible deniability because she's living in a society where women aren't supposed to have sexual agency. I think that that's a very big thing to remember. Um, you know, she wants to, but there's a lot of social pressure to have to say no and so it kind of like socially became this game that men and women had to play you know she she has to say no because society expects this he knows this and he's supplying the excuses um 
it, it's 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 about a woman looking for a way out to 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 find um and, and exercise sexual agency in a patriarchal society designed to stop her from having sexual agency yeah um so you know i, I think that this is kind of an important thing to remember that you know when we think about rape culture, it's not just that as women, we've historically um, been ignored at the no. It's historically, we also been denied the ability to say yes, want to say yes. Um, that's screwed us up. I think, you know, in, in, in brief reflection, I can kind of see a lot of ways where that's actually kind of screwed us up more than, 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 than the no. Hmm. Well, you know, it's, it, you know, we, we, we also come from a culture where it wasn't up until fairly recently that uh, a yes from a woman for a sexual encounter with someone who she who was not committed to her was an invitation to pregnancy and could become something that was very bad, a big problem, a huge, uh, a huge social mistake, a huge, uh, um, you know, it, it would completely destroy her, uh, not, you know, her reputation and her prospects. And it isn't until fairly recently where that's, uh, that's stopped being a, uh, a lead pipe cinch, you know, to, quite a, you know, to use a term, uh, that, that every time you do something like this, that you're, uh, you're, you're shredding your, your reputation. Absolutely. And, and keep in mind too, that even people born after the sex, the, the sexual re revolution, or maybe even because of the sexual revolution, um, you know, Again, these attitudes are systemic and they're deeply embedded. So even though our attitudes about sex and, and, and being allowed to say yes have changed, you know, we, we still have a lot of slut shaming that goes on in our culture. Um, you know, and, and, and in the context of the song, you know, for her to be able to stay with this guy and spend the night with him, um, it, it, it's better, you know, and, and again, scary air quotes that you can't see. Um, it's better if he's the cad, because if he's not the cad, then she's the slut. And he can actually live with the reputation of cad. It's not going to hurt him. Yeah, there's, uh, there, there's a lot less uh, um, social capital that he loses by being the cad. And in fact, he can be the lovable cad, you know, the, and the redeemable cad. I mean, this is also one of the, the big, uh, the big plots of all of these, uh, these horrible Wattpad stories of, uh, you know, the bad boy who I tame, who I, the woman tamed, uh, you know, because of the sort of thing. Keep in mind that, uh, Wattpad is overwhelmingly female authors and overwhelmingly they are under the age of 30. Absolutely. So. And keep in mind, too, you know, I was thinking about, like, a fandom connection to this day, too, because, you know, I, I, I've taken some criticism from the Star Wars fandom um, in pointing out that, you know, the scene in Breaks Back where Han and Leia kiss for the first time, you know, in, in some ways, it's a, it doesn't play as well now as it used to, because, you know, you watch the scene and he grabs her hand and she starts rubbing it. And what's the first thing she says? Stop that. That's so right. Already, yeah, and so already she has said, no, I don't consent to this, but he keeps doing it and telling her to relax and all this stuff. And so the, the, overall, she, Leia gets framed as this ice princess that just needs the right man to thaw her out and show her what she really, really wants. And, you know, this is something that I've been struggling with for the last couple of years, but then when, when this thing about the song came up today, like, I kind of, like, had this aha moment, right? So, first of all, we, we have to consider that Star Wars was based on uh, films from the same era as the song. So, you know, Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, that kind of thing. That was George Lucas's idea that he wanted to bring to the 70s. So, number one, he's almost got to be that kind of heroine in order for it to have like the same kind of flavor. And so again, we have this, this, this push pull, um, we're, we're shown Leia, a woman who likewise, because of her position, um, 
I, I, I think that kind of what's clumsily being communicated here is that she is also a woman who does not have the agency to say, yes, the, 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 the smuggler, this criminal, he's, he's really good looking and I want to go have all kinds of awesome consensual sex with him. But, you know, we, we, we have to have this banter. We have to have, you know, the softening of this Bickerson's relationship that we had, um, you know. And, and so it just kind of like, of a sudden, I just had this clear vision of how, you know, she, she's been written as this woman who doesn't have the agency. So that same kind of... Um, social obligation to protest, even if that's not what she wants, um, exists for her. So I, I kind of think that that's kind of an interesting of that scene of the Empire Strikes Back that I didn't have. There, there's definitely a, uh, a 40s feel to it. It's, um, it's, it seems a lot almost like um, Claude, Claude Colbert and um, Clark Gable in uh, It Happened One Night. It was actually in the 30s, I think. Uh, you know, you really, you really do want it. You just don't know that you want. It. Yeah, and even if you look at the movie poster, you know the comparison. You know, you have Han Solo bending Princess Leia's body back in that embrace where he's about to kiss her, and you know the comparison has been made actually to, um, you know, Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara. Um, so you know, I, I mean, again, just these parallels to that. That, that general time period of Hollywood seemed to kind of play that out. So now, I, I mean, I kind of have to do some, some ruminating on this, but then I'm kind of wondering if maybe, okay, maybe the scene is problematic, but not for the reasons we think it's problematic. Hmm, yeah. This will take some more unpacking. Want to talk uh, Gary Newman? Yeah, so... Um, Again, we'll we'll put the link up to his big U.S. hit. Um, but you know he has had a forty-year career, um, and and his latest album makes album number twenty-one for him. Um, I want to say I I've almost lost count how many times I've seen this guy in concert. I my first trip to England was specifically to go see him in concert because um, he hadn't toured in the U.S. in like fifteen years. Um, he hadn't toured in England in, in a long time. And so he comes out with a new album. He tours. And so um, the man I was living with at the time, uh, we, we just decided, okay, we're going to go. We're going to go see a few shows and, and see some of England. So it, it was, uh, we weren't just deadheading a concert. We were getting some culture, too. Um, well, you know, music's culture. Um, Definitely. But yeah. So, you know, I saw him like, you know, four or five times while I was already over there that first time. And then, of course, you know, we, we, we invest all this uh, you know, money and time and other resources into a, a, a trip to the UK. And then he announces a U.S. tour. So we ended up following that, um, that tour for um, several shows around the, the general um, Great Lakes area. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about him is because, you know, is just so wonderful and gracious with his fans. And particularly, um, you know, we did this in England, but also particularly when he's come to the U.S., he is one of those artists that, you know, when the show's over, he comes out, he goes to his tour bus. After he's had some time to relax, take a shower, that kind of thing, he um, typically comes out, signs autographs, will, will take that selfie with you, and um, he generally doesn't leave until everybody has had their chance. Uh, now, last night was a little bit different story because he apparently wasn't feeling well. So he just kind of went straight to the tour bus. But one of his handlers did come out and say, hey, you just give me one thing. I'll take it inside. He said he'll sign one thing from everybody. So everybody at least still got their autograph. Which That's fantastic. I, just, I know. He's just so generous and gracious with his fans. And, um, you know, so so few people know um, about him, especially in the United States. And so what I found interesting is, you know, with this new album um, called Savage that just came out, um, I didn't know this, but he's basically been blacklisted from the Billboard electronic charts um, in, the, in, in, in the late 70s. His sound was very, very synth pop, but then uh, he kind of evolved to more of this like um, 
gothic post-punk industrial kind of sound so like um he uh last couple of years he's even like collaborated with trent reznor so to kind of give you an idea of what his sound is like now it's 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 kind of like that um but because uh his electronic music isn't fun fun happy happy you know raver kid disco club kind of thing um they aren't counting him on their charts which is just kind of like really really sad because um as one of the articles that i'm going to post uh says um he had he been counted uh when his album was when the last single was released um it probably would have broke the charts at around number two. Oh man so, yeah, so they're, they're they're just doing doing stuff to him that's not nice yeah it, it really sucks and and so i found another article that you know kind of like um illustrates in a different way like kind of like how these systemic biases uh kind of work because you know it's like okay they're they're blaming it on the sound being wrong but there's actually kind of like this also like this link to ageism because you know he is um in his uh late 50s um you know he has been doing music forever um but you know this this chart snub is actually kind of more than just like oh you know um you know, just not the right sound. I mean, but when you really think about it, it almost sounds like those appeals to canonicity that are actually, um, you know, almost invisible racism, like, uh, oh, well, there's no such thing as a black stormtrooper. <laughs> that well, kind it, of thing. Well, you oh, know, there, there, there's also in the, in the music business, or at least there there was, but I assume there still is, the um, the idea that the, the band has got to be... Um, has got to be eye candy. They got, they've got to be pretty, and that's uh, and and Martha Wash in particular uh, was often kind of shoved into the background as a sort of this, um, you know, the, this singer. But then they, then they put somebody else out there uh, to be the the dancer and whatnot because she's color and she's a rather large woman, um, but also has a big booming fantastic voice. She's the voice behind um, It's Raining Men. Absolutely. And she's also um, done collaborations with Todd Terry. Um, she had a lot of dance music hits. And, uh, you know, I mean, God, man, you just made me have all these flashbacks to like my days when I was clubbing because I just, you know, anytime anything that she sang on, I mean, I don't care what I was in the middle of doing. If I was in the ladies room, I would quick finish up, flush, wash and get out there so I could <laughs> dance to her stuff, you know, because um, I just I liked her that much. And she's just got this um, she's got this big, booming, beautiful, but also very pure voice. And, and um, it just lends itself to the dance genre so nicely um so yeah I, I think that a lot of that uh does fall in uh with, with what's been going on with gary newman um some interesting things that some people might not know about him either is that uh, number one he is on the autism spectrum uh what we used to call uh asperger syndrome uh we now call uh spectrum one um you know but he's been working on it he gets better with it um and he also has the double whammy of suffering from depression and, and struggling with that so when, when you consider how gracious he is with his fans and in giving them his time and his attention it, it just kind of makes you appreciate it even more because you know I, I'm sure that you know some days it's easier for him than others um, but you know it can't be easy all the time and for him to give up that much of himself his fans and to put all that energy in performance and, and I tell you it was a hell of a performance it always has been every time I've seen him but man last night's show in particular um, kind of one of the best ever um, you know it, it just he really gives pieces that most people don't really think of. so for him to be so underappreciated as an artist i felt it was really important to talk about him cool and yeah I know, and, and i know you had a good time which is always good too yeah, I had a great time. And you know what? When we do the blog post, um, I will post a couple of uh, the better photos that I took. I got a new phone. Um, and, oh, my God, the camera on it is just 
so great compared to my old phones. So like there are some that like I'm actually quite proud of. Um, one of the things too yeah. that I kind of wanted to hit on too, because we've talked about this idea before, is um, that of cultural appropriation. And a couple of the reviews that I've read of the Savage album is actually calling him out for cultural appropriation because uh, number one, um, there he has like a lot of heavily heavy influence um, of Arabic music and Arabic sounds in in this latest album, and. Because like his name on the front of the album, it's almost like stylized like Arabic script. Um, a couple of reviewers have called him out for cultural appropriation, which I'm kind of thinking, okay, his name on the front of the album maybe not so great, but in terms of the music, um, no, it, it's not one of these things where really profiting off of something that he's claiming is his um you know or 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 totally exploiting um a, a population it's more um it's more like the story that he's telling and in the, uh in the article that I'm going to post about this um you know he he's talking about kind of like almost like this science fiction story um it, the, the album savage is very uh post apocalyptic and so if you kind of think of um you know the show uh firefly or the movie serenity you know you kind of had this um blending of eastern and western cultures where you had um you know what like english and chinese kind of mixing um, he kind of has a similar idea in terms of, you know, Western sounds and Arabic sounds kind of mixing like that. So I, I think that, you know, again, um, it needs a little bit more textualized. Um, you know, I, I think that there are some aspects, like I said, the logo, not great, but the music, I think that it's totally explainable, especially considering he's not trying to take credit for another culture's work as his own. You know, it, it also kind of makes me wonder about, um, for music in particular, because we, we've seen in the past any number of artists who have uh, brought in influences uh, from other cultures. You know, I'm thinking of, um, like, George Harrison uh, bringing the sitar to uh, to the Beatles and then to his own. Uh, to his own uh, individual works, and uh, also um, Paul Simon uh, with uh, Lady Smith Black uh, Mabaza. God, I've probably just mangled that name. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that is it. Appropriation? Is it? Is it homage? Is it appreciation? Is it getting uh, uh, artists and certain types of music out? in front of a bigger audience than they would have been able to uh, get in front of on their own is, you know, what's the, you know, it, it, it's sort of hard to, hard to say what it really does, you know, where, it, you know, where does, where does the, um, you know, where, where does it, where does it phase over from being uh, something positive to being something that's, you know, even almost patronizing? Yeah, and I think in his case, it's it's more cultural appreciation than appropriation, you know. And, and I think that that would be kind of an easier idea for some to follow. Like I said, if the logo on the front of the album, um, what was was different, um, but you know, as you read the article and you understand, like you know, the story that he was trying to tell with the album, and and then it's also like a very personal one, um, it, it almost kind of starts to make better sense and looking at it on the surface. Uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, I, I'd be curious to see when uh, when it when it goes in the other direction. <laughs> but although I suppose it does. Uh, uh, so, so um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so that was like, you know, my whole big thing. And, you know, we, we've got the holidays coming up here pretty soon. So, yeah. so I'm just kind of wondering, what what's up? What are your plans? I have like no plans at all. Um, I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna write like the wind. Uh, Hanukkah starts on December twelfth. Uh, it's an eight day holiday, obviously, and uh, so that'll be uh, done a bit later. I will be home uh, slash working, but I work from home, so it's the same thing. And uh, and and 
we'll, we'll light candles. We, we do that. It's one of the only really religious things that we do during any given year is we will light Hanukkah candles. We'll do that. And uh, maybe I'll make latkes because we have potatoes. So yay, we could do that. And um, <laughs> I don't know what else. I, you know, like I said, I'll probably just be writing uh, and, and also editing because that's the other thing about NaNoWriMo is uh, – you end up with this big big can of words and suddenly it's oh my god we have to actually you know make sentences out of it what right on well and, for myself oh go ahead yeah well i also have um i also have editing from stuff that i did over the summer that i've been neglecting so i will actually i'll probably end up doing and let this other one sit and ferment for a little while so yeah please go ahead no, I was just going to say, I, I'm feeling like you and I are leading very similar lives because, you know, the, the first the, the first week that we don't have classes, um, the semester is still technically going on because I'm grading and grading jail for a while. Uh, but after that, like my only real plans, um, you know, Christmas Day, I, I was raised in, in a Christian household, even though I kind of live a little bit more secular uh, these days. Um, but, you know, I still go up for Christmas and, I, you know, we go to my aunt's house, we have dinner, we watch some TV. Um, you know, we hang out. Um, sometimes my relatives want haircuts, you know, so I'm, I'm never really completely retired from the hair biz. Oh, um, I know, right? Um, but, you know, I'm just going to be using the time to, um, you know, work on my proposal for my dissertation. And I have a paper to write because I got accepted to uh, the, the Popular Culture Association Conference in Indianapolis. So I have to write a paper about the X-Files now. <laughs> so, no, and I'm just going to be revising other things for journal submissions. So hopefully I can get some publications before I graduate. Fantastic. Yeah. To your name and lights. Um, so, <laughs> or, or, or print, if nothing else. So so next month, oh my God. Oh my God. Fan stuff coming up. Oh, it's awesome. It's this embarrassment of riches. Yeah. Like by, by the time we do the next show, I will probably have seen Star Wars The Last Jedi eight bazillion times. So just get ready for me to like not talk about anything else. <laughs> Okay, so now we know what we're going to be talking about. Awesome! This is great because you know we uh, we have to we have to get our our act in gear. So uh, we'll have our outline probably taken care of with that. <laughs> Pretty much, and especially since I'm doing this dissertation on Star Wars, you know, I'm going to have a lot of you know probably academic things to add to whatever's happening. So um, that that'll be fun. Um, January is probably yeah, I'm I'm going to be just as much of a mess because you know January third the X Files comes back for season eleven so we finally get to re resolve that cliffhanger from two years ago, um, and and Star Trek Discovery comes back Yay! on January seventh so another cliffhanger and my God I am just so happy to be a fan right now. Yeah, it's just this. This is such a such an amazing time. This is just an amazing. Time. And then today, uh, just announced, uh, season three of Stranger Things is gonna be, gonna be a thing. Uh, so no specific dates yet or anything, but we just we do know that they ordered another season. And um, Riverdale spinoff Sabrina is coming to Netflix. They have ordered two seasons, and they're looking for a 2019. So awesome, awesome, and um, and uh, and obviously there there'll be second season of uh, of uh, Star Trek Discovery in uh, twenty. So uh, it's yeah, this is this is a fantastic time to be a fan. There's lots and lots of neat new things coming up, uh, things we've never seen before, and uh, what I'm so pleased about is that they're not retreads of old stuff. Oh my god! Oh <laughs> I'm so yeah. Happy about that. I, I'm I'm just so stoked. I I, I, I can't even. It, it's going to take me a while to even be articulate about any of it because I'm just going to be like so excited <laughs> that it, it's just going to be hard. You know, words. Um, yeah, words, things. You know? <laughs> it's sort of that. Um, you know, the, those uh, that those those poor women in uh, or, or young girls in uh, like 1964, uh, kind of yelling and crying at the Beatles. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, which funny that you mentioned that because when I was writing the paper about the gendering of fans and fandom, that's kind of like where, you know, I kind of located the origin of our gendered understanding of fandom because you know we 
fangirls do get the reputation of being um, sex obsessed and and out of control, and and it goes back to this idea of you know the, the crazed groupie who's ready to rip the clothes off their favorite pop star. Yeah, and and, and heck, it, it even goes back to the um the 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 Sinatra, the Bobby Talkers. Absolutely, we're all gaga over him too. Yeah, so you know, girls and their hormones, and <laughs> yeah, no, that, that that dangerous female sexuality. Oh my god. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, we 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 talked a long time today, and and, and uh, you know, listeners, like it's kind of like a sorry not sorry kind of thing because you know <laughs> the, the, this, well, the, this this. The sex scandal thing was really, really important, and we couldn't really gloss over it, but we had other stuff that needed attention. Um, you know, we, we, we hope that you learned something from it, and, and, and we hope that we gave you a little bit of f- food for thought. Definitely, and, uh, and and if you have more names, my God, this is going to be a really big list. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and obviously we have and um uh, certainly, if you have uh, questions, comments, suggestions, uh, observations, <laughs> contact us. Uh, there's a contact page on our site, um, which is, of course, semanticshenanigans.com, or you can send us an email. I believe it's hosts, plural, at semanticshenanigans.com, or you can tweet at us. We are two shenanigans, that's number two, on Twitter. And, um, of course, we have a, um, a Facebook page, which is, of course, is Are we ready to wrap? We are. I just lost you for a minute there. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Whatever I, I, I was am... saying it was a lie. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I am so ready to wrap. So we will see you next month. Uh, come join us for our Star Wars extravaganza. On ice. <laughs> this time it's personal with sharks. <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, and with laser beams on their heads. And uh, <laughs> freaking laser beams. So, yeah, we're, um, and, and, um, and, and hopefully we will find the articles of clothing that are hanging around our homes uh, somewhere in the um, in the vortex. Watch for that update. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know this is this is crucial. I know you're hanging on the interviews. Anyway, so thank you so much for uh, for listening and for indulging us. And um, happy holidays. Happy Ooh. holidays. Even though we'll talk to you probably before, or, you know, they're they're all completely over. Um, but yeah, do enjoy. Be good. Play nice and make good choices. That's uh, that 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 sounds awesome. And uh, live long, prosper, and all that other happy stuff. Thanks for listening. So, thank you. Peace out. Bye bye. Music provided by Invocation Array. Send mail to hosts at semanticshenanigans dot com. Follow us on Twitter at Two Shenanigans. That's the number, not the word. Two Shenanigans. On Facebook, you can find us at Semantic Shenanigans. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Semantic Shenanigans. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Semantic Shenanigans. We'll be right back.